I'm sitting with Diane Tor, who is uh, in New York City for what seems to be a Diane Tor festival, uh, the New York premiere of a documentary on her life work called Man for, Man for a Day, and, uh, and a time to reconnect with a lot of the students and uh, people that you have done work with over the last 30 years here in New York City. Thank you. Um, we're in a wonderful, authentic Mexican restaurant on the Lower East Side. If you can believe there still is something authentic on the Lower East Side, it is here. Um, and this is, she's unwrapping her tamale. Okay. And, and, last night at, and, and last night at Dixon Place, uh, Diane presented a, um, oh, two, a, a tribute <coughs> to her brother, Donald. Yeah. Thank you. Call some, Donald. Some water. Sorry. Thanks. Uh, we're very busy getting our coffee and our, our <laughs> breakfast together here. Oh, and you'll hear some background noise because this is a small little place. But I, uh, uh, location is very, has always seemed to be very important to you, Diane. Well, yeah. <laughs> Isn't it to everybody? I have an idea, a request. Why don't yeah. we take our hat off? Oh, okay. So they can see your face. Sure. I'm going to give you this one. Okay, the other one is small. You came to New York City in the middle 70s, is that correct? Mm. Go. 76. 76. And you came from? Well, I came from the UK. Yeah. I went to art school in England, Dartington College of Art. But I grew up in Scotland, in Aberdeen, north of Scotland. Are you voting in the election? Yeah. From, I will definitely vote, yeah. You want to share with us what you're voting? Well, you know, there are for and against. I mean, the idea of being independent is kind of scary because I am scared. Of, well, no, but it's not just that. It's just nationalism itself I find questionable. And what's that about? But at the same time, I understand the desire to dispense with the Tories. You know, and they run everything. I mean, who votes for Tories in England, in the UK? It's, they're all in the southeast and southwest. Nobody kind of in the north or in Scotland votes Tory. Maybe one or two people. There aren't, and it's just to say that there aren't many Tory MPs north of somewhere like, I don't know. Um, well, the Midlands, you know. Anyway, yeah. There's a lot of good things to be had, but also a lot of things. You grew up in Scotland and. Um, the UK is such a class-based um, yeah. system. How would you identify the, the class that you grew up in? Um, I'd say probably lower middle class, something like that. Parents were professional? No, my father, yeah, my father was a mechanical engineer. Mm -hmm. And my mother was a housewife, and then she was a secretary. And I had two brothers. But, um, Older and younger? They're both older. Yeah. You were the baby. I was the youngest, yeah. So I had to I had to fight my corner a lot with my brothers. You know, I had to make sure that they Well, I had to make sure that they fought with each other instead of fighting with me. <laughs> <laughs> and did you how did you get to art school in London? Um, it was actually in Devon in, in, in England. Devon. A long journey. I mean I didn't go to college until I was 26, and before that, I worked for an agency. I was a temp secretary, and then I worked for this agency. It was a sort of help service for young people in London, run by... We used to go to pop festivals and help people who were high on drugs. And Then uh, I went to Afghanistan with this organization to set up an organization there, visiting people in jail who'd been arrested for drugs. That was in 1973. Did you go with your main career? No. She fell in love with Afghani men and changed her book, that whole book about... Yeah. <laughs> no. I, I, in fact, I had no idea at that time that... Yeah. Agree. No, I had no idea. No, I, I was working for this agency. I, I just want to say that I, I that, that was a little titter about Jermaine. I had enormous respect for the work that mm. she did. And I did know no, no. in the 60s when she lived here sure. before her, her feminist fame. Yeah, yeah. 
So you had had a rounded experience, yeah. okay? Mm -hmm. And then you decided what? Well, when I was in Afghanistan, I did a lot of dancing because they have these great musicians. They play this down, this two-string instrument. Mm -hmm. Well, you never see women dancing in Afghanistan. I mean, this is pre-Russian invasion, pre-Taliban when you had all these different tribes living side by side, as they had for centuries. And some women were veiled and some wore brightly colored dresses and some women, you know, they were all different. Um, was it a secular society? Um, I don't think so. I think, I think it was tribal? more, yeah, definitely tribal, definitely. And they didn't have a, a developed telecommunication system at all. So what went on in Kabul, Nobody, nobody paid any attention. They just got on with their lives, you know, as they have for centuries. You know. um, um, I mean, it was fascinating that opportunity to go to Afghanistan, um, visiting people in jail, and I went to a woman's jail in Kabul. And what was that like? Well, there were women in there who who been sent to jail with their children for slapping their husband's face, incarcerated. Disobedience, disrespect of the husband to get um, through jail time with your kids, and and also he he a lot of the men had other wives, you know, this is one less to deal with, one less to take care of. At this point, would you have said that you were a conscious feminist, or you were just a young, vivacious, hottest <laughs> woman in the world? No, I was a Marxist feminist. From, you know, 68 on, very, very involved in women's liberation, as it was called then. Juliet Mitchell? Um, Juliet Mitchell, uh, Susan Rowbottom. You know, I, in fact, the first women's liberation meeting I went to was hosted by Juliet Mitchell. Wow. That was in 968, Kentish Town, this place called, it was called Hole in the Wall. It was a meeting place, you know. Um, so, yeah, I, I've always been very active. And when I went to art school, I... They never had any political anything at Dartington. And I just was the spitfire, went through the place, you know, demanding that everybody get called Miss and not Miss, and um, spend a certain amount of the li library's money on feminist books and help the cleaners to unionize and, you know. I mean, this is a very particular time, though, 1968, yeah. you have the French student. No, but I didn't go to uh, I didn't go to school until '74. No, but I was working in, in London. <clears throat> I was working in London um, before that, and and got very involved in. So how did do you remember if you did read or and if you did what kind of impact she was with Firestone put no, that on you? Of course, dialectics of sex. Yeah. No. You sucked up all that stuff. I mean, it, that was, to me, the most radical book. Oh, definitely. Um, phenomenal. Um, you know, when I, when I came to this country in 76, I worked for this feminist newspaper called Majority Report uh -huh. on Sheridan Square. It's mm -hmm. above the, what's now Who's the bank. editor of that? It was Nancy Borman. She's, she's not here anymore. But um, all kinds of people came through there, like... Um, Susan Brown Miller and Kate Millett and Valerie Solanus and I mean all these people came through and I, I met them you know in that milieu and when you work for an alternative or a feminist press or whatever you have to do everything paste up and lay out and selling ads and writing articles and interviewing you know it's like majority report and um, off our backs with sort of the two principal print vehicles of yeah, feminist feminist exactly yeah um, you know, when I first came here, I, I, had, I had nothing. I, I, all I had was a J-1 student visa to study at the Cunningham Studios for a year. Dance. Yeah, that's my background is in dance. Yeah. I studied with a lot of dance revolutionaries, like Steve Paxton, who developed contact with musicians. He came to... Did you climb a wall? Climb a wall, no. And you never climbed a wall with Steve Paxton? No, but I'm sure that would be an exercise that he would do, yeah, I can imagine. And he became a friend, and he came to Dartington. It was the first time that Steve Paxton, or the first time that contact organization was uh, shown or taught in, in the UK. And that was in 75. 
and Yvonne. And Yvonne, Yvonne Rayner, she never came to the UK. She was in her filmmaking period then. But uh, the woman who was our head of dance department, Mary, Mary Fulkerson, she was from Illinois. And she knew all these amazing people. Trisha Brown. Oh, well, she didn't bring Trisha Brown. Nancy Topf, who later died, unfortunately. But she did a lot of release work working with the um, pelvis. That was her specialty. The, the, um, Do you think that that's a gender-based issue for dancers? What? Pelvis. Oh, um, well, actually, Seriously. I don't know. I don't know if it's gender-based, but... Nancy's thing was the psoas muscle, and the psoas muscle is the main postural muscle mm -hmm. attached um, to the to the vertebrae at the back, and then goes through the, the abdomen, and then attaches to the the, the um, femur bones. You know, the greater the um, acetabulum, the head of the femur bones in the body. So you have the sheet of muscle, which is the main postural muscle, the psoas. And if you don't develop that, you know, you get lodorsis, for instance. Anyway, a lot of crawling in her classes. But um, I'm just... So you're very body conscious. Yeah, and I think, for me, you know, I learned a lot through the body. I should have got my book. I just realized you probably wouldn't... I have, a, I have a book, you know. What's your book? It's called... I should have brought it. I have a, some copies of it. It's called um, Sex, Drag, and Male Roles, Investigating Gender as Performance. When did that come out? That came out in 2010. So that's the University of Michigan Press. But I wrote it with um, Steve Bottoms, who was a professor at Glasgow University at the time. He's a theater historian. He also wrote a foreword to Penny Arcade's book. He's a, he's a lovely guy. I really enjoy the collaboration. He's a nice, sensitive academic. He's lovely. How special. He is right. very special. No, so I, I really did well. Oh, having... so let me pull you back for a moment. Mm. It's 1976, 1977, 1978. Right. You're in New York. Right. You are a radical Marxist lesbian. <laughs> Marxist. Yeah. I, was, I wouldn't call myself a lesbian. You were a radical Marxist, 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 Marxist feminist. Marxist feminist, yeah. I, you know, I was very involved in the lesbian scene. I would go to the Duchess, Bonnie and Clyde. So well, you know. that, was done at, that was done at that time with yeah. feminism. But, um, and I also have always had women lovers and also men, too. I mean, it's not... I haven't been partial. In yeah, that way. was an accident, by the way, of my saying feminist. Oh, lesbian. Because I think you have created, at least for my days, an illusion of what is she, you know? Uh, and then you just settle on just Diane, you know, um, which is, which is, but that's I think ultimately is what we hope we all can do. Right? An individual. You know, this person's an individual. Now, when did you have your daughter? Um, she was born in 1983. And, um, Oh God, it's so stupid I didn't bring my book. Anyway, I was actually selling the book at, at the film, when the film was shown in the So, Sorry, my, my daughter. Um, how did that come about? Well, so I, we're, we're talking about 78, 79. Uh, that was a very experimental time yeah, definitely. in downtown New York in music and visual arts and dance. A lot of a lot. I did a lot of work at PS122. Mm -hmm. um, I was working for a go -go dan as a go-go dancer in New Jersey, working in all these very nefarious um, working men's bars in Haddison, Harrison, C. Caucus, Newark. Um, you How know, did you square that with your? radical feminism. Well, this was interesting, because how did I? And this was an issue for me. This is important for kids today who think sex work is not... A lot of sex work is done by artists because it's the only way they can afford to pay the money. I know. Well, I didn't have a green card. You know, how was I going to survive? At that time, there was a lot more communication between artists, a lot of sharing that went on. So American friends would say, well, why don't you just make a social security number? It's just four numbers and two numbers and three numbers. And I like, oh, okay. And they said, but try to be consistent. Don't keep changing. 
So I used that to get to work as um, an art model, SVA and Parsons. Um, and then I, when I started go-go dancing um, in New Jersey, that, that was a dilemma for me as a feminist. And I, at the very beginning, when I first started working, I thought, oh my god, this is so boring. It's so formulaic. Can't these men see how formulaic this is? And I was a punk, you know. Yeah. And so I, I created this punk performance, which was a parody of going dancing, you know. And that's what I did do, because I never made any No, I never made any tips. <laughs> Except for the Mexican immigrants who didn't know what go go was. So I had a conversation with myself, well, what are you going to do? You know, are you going to do it or you're not? But, you know, I decided that I would do it, but I would do it on my terms, um, which is maybe not so possible now, I don't know. But uh, I saw it as an opportunity also to explore ideas of the erotic. I mean, that, that's where the erotic is fixed. So we see it in, in this world. And in your cultural world, and in your feminist world, um, was there any criticism of you, or was there support of you making this choice? Because this is before the Columbia Bad Girl Feminism Conference, mm. which took place in 1980, I think. Yeah. I didn't get to that. I, I, um, I did a performance about go dancing. I did several performances. The first was at WOW in 1980. I brought in these go-go dancers to work with me. Real go-go. 81. Yeah, oh, yeah. I met these women in 1981. I met these women in New Jersey, and they were amazing. I thought, God, they're so much better than a lot of the downtown performance artists I've seen. And so I, I wanted some cross-fertilization to go on. You know? So we, we, Peggy Shaw asked me if I wanted to perform at WOW, and I was like, yeah. And I thought, oh, that would be great, to bring these go-go dancers. So... We created a performance in which, you know, because as a go-go dancer, you're a decor, you're, you're wallpaper for the man's fantasy. But what if the decor started to talk, you know? So we did um, this show that actually caused so much trouble. It was the first time that women had performed exotically at a women's festival. And my idea was always, you know, women have been performing sexually for men for decades. What would the aesthetic be like if we were performing for women? Anyway, um, a lot of people stopped talking to me. It just, you know, I was ostracized and, you know, par for the course. I don't care. <laughs> but then we got reviewed in somewhere, I don't know. It wasn't Village Boys, it was something like the Villager. And they said, oh, that this was the best performance in the whole festival. And after that, everybody started talking to me again. You know, in New York, politics goes by the wayside. When, when, when somebody gets a good review, it's like, oh yeah, oh you know I really liked you. Even people are telling me now, oh yeah, you know I always liked your go-go dancing. Class. How many years later is it? So, um, okay, whatever. But then navigating I, the um, sort of political correctness and, and being an artist and the sort of transgressive nature. Of being an artist and, and the kind of work that you, you, you're you being a punk artist, so to speak, and, and the economic reality. Thank you. Uh, do you, you want some water? Yeah. Uh, and, the, and the economic reality mm. of survival, even at that period, which was much easier to survive, mm. but still, um, one had to figure out how to pay one friend. You weren't getting paid at PS122. No. You weren't getting paid at Wow. Well, were you? No. I don't think so, but I mean, it has to do with regular income, and I, I read... And you don't want to be a secretary anymore. Well, I was actually working as a secretary as well, so but the temp work was few and far between, you know, it wasn't all the time. Thank you. It was very funny, one time I was working as a secretary in this place called Morality in the Media, which was a Catholic organization during the Nkoga dancing. <laughs> It was so funny. I loved that sort of juxtaposition because, you know, it was all... Anyway, I, I, I searched and searched and searched to find some information that would help me understand the dialectic of this whole situation. And um, I read Andrew Dworkin's pornography, and I, I read it when I was go-go dancing, and I realized 
this isn't, you know, she's not interested in sex workers. She's, an, you know, just offended by what we're, how we're portrayed. Well, through this friend Sarah Schulman, a friend of hers, Robin Epstein, who's a playwright, knew Andrew Dworkin and told Andrew Dworkin that I was reading her book while I was go dancing. And Andrea Dworkin called me up. And, you know, we had this conversation. And I said to and Andrew Dworkin said, well, you know, this is so disrespectful. The woman shouldn't do this kind of work. And I said, oh, would you prefer a kind of covert sexuality, you know, as exists as a, as a secretary or a waitress? You try being a waitress and you don't smile or flirt with the customer. You're not going to get hit. You know, you're not, and as, as a secretary, you know, you're not available to go out and small talk with the boss and his friends and, like, the small girly to their bullshit, you know. And she said, she said, uh, she didn't, she, she thought that that was preferable to working in the sex industry and, and it was perpetuating um, this image of women which was uh, detrimental because of the objectification of it. And anyway, I said, you know, there's so many women that are working in the sex trade who don't have an education. And maybe a single mother with three children, they're bringing up on their own. What do you want them to do? Go work at McDonald's for like three dollars an hour, which is what the lower, it was then, for three fifty, I think. And <coughs> so you know, they're working. You know, they, they would work in a go-go bar and dance for three nights, and they would be able to make enough money. I mean, what, what would you? And she, she wouldn't even go there. And, you know, in the end, I hung up the phone because I said, you know, I just you know reached an impasse with her. It's just impossible. She was standing in this higher moral ground. You know? She was well, not only higher moral ground, but she was really vested in theory. And you were talking about the practical reality of these women's lives. And that's always to me been the, the, the dialectic. Definitely. Uh, uh, the, well, if we could all live in a perfect world, you know. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, I, my own, I've always been very concerned about people who do sex work. Um, and, and I'm using a general term which is not about prostitution mm. exclusively. It's about anything that plays upon uh, male desire, so to speak. Although you did try to explore what female desire might be at the same time. Yeah. Um, but, it's, but it's always been clear to me that survival uh, it, it, you really need to be put into that motion. Um, it became very fashionable but after the bad girl feminist conference at Columbia to say we're all whores, you know, the wives were whores, we're all, well, I always, I always thought, no, you're not all, you're not all whores. In reality, um, you have some choices and options, but, but some women have no choices and options. That's a way of denigrating the situation, denigrating the position of a woman who's, who's actually a sex worker by equating yourself with them. Like, you are in a position to be able to support yourself without doing sex work. No, you're not a whore. <laughs> um, so it's denying what is really going on. You know. Did you know Karen Finley at this point? Uh, yeah, no, I saw her at um, Vance Turian, you know. I mean, it was a small scene in the, in the East Village. Kathy Ak I mean, there were yeah, these all kinds these of uh, yeah. transgressive, feminist... Uh, I think I, I was definitely on my own track, you know, I was, I mean, I was working as a go-go dancer and did that show at WOW and then brought, I was invited to a festival in Amsterdam the following year, 82, and it caused a riot. There were these women, all these dungaree lesbians, dungaree dykes as we call them who were totally offended by the performance. Didn't see... Did they see it, by the way? Yeah, they came. There were 1,300 women. We were performing on Decadent Night. And uh, they started throwing beer mats at us. And, and I was like, ah, I'm not performing. And then the director said, go back. And then they started throwing beer bottles. And then the electricity went out. And it was a riot. And we had to escape through the back door of the theater, which was through all the series of tunnels. We didn't know our way. Somebody helped us, but on the way out, this woman from Suriname grabbed me by the arm, and I thought, oh my god, what's going on now? Because all these women arm linked themselves to the front door, these bulldozer dykes arm linked themselves to the front door so we couldn't leave. And there were women asking for their money back, because it wasn't the kind of performance they expected to see at a women's festival. Well, I mean, this is how women are surviving here, you know, and that's the whole point. Let me, let me look at it from a different angle. Pleasure. Mm. Um, 
dancers usually um, have no shame about their bodies, mm. unless they're working on that issue through dance. But usually they're very body-centric. And uh, no one ever talks about that it might actually be pleasurable doing go-go dancing, despite all the contradictions, as opposed to this is a horrible thing I have to do and I'm just like, mm. uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, one of the things I did, I started bringing my own costumes and my own music, you know, 80s music, you know, like, um, um, uh, Tainted Love, you know, Tainted Love and I mean, Rick James. I mean, there was a lot of early Madonna, great stuff to dance to, you know. I just, I just brought in my own music because I just decided I was going to take control of the situation and do what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So then at the beginning, the men were sort of slightly, what is this? But then I started getting $20 tips because I was sort of using rubber and rubber snakes and leather and, you know, playing around with all these stuff. It was my own exploration as well. Yeah. And this, this guy, I, so I started getting $20 tips instead of $1 tips. And then it was, oh, where's Tornado playing? Oh, that was my dad's name was Tornado. Where's Tornado playing next week? And, so I became a kind of, yeah. Perfect. Okay. And uh, so the, the, I became this kind of, un, you know, underground, uh, under Newark, under <laughs> Sea Caucus, under Patterson, you know, I mean, how can you be underground in this place? But you know what I mean? It was sort of a reputation and a yeah. following. Yeah, so I, 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 so I was just determined to do my own thing, actually, I was not, and I wanted to enjoy it, you know. Yeah, Having I, a brother I, like Donald. Do you think you know? that that's an important element of of finding a way to enjoy what you're doing, or, or if you can't enjoy it, then you should stop. Would you say that? Yeah, but I think a lot of people don't have the liberty to stop, you know? Okay. Um, one book that I read that was very helpful when I was go dancing was by Angela Carter, and it's called The Sadian Woman. Have you, have you read that book? Do you know who Angela Carter is? Mm, no. She's an English writer who I definitely recommend. But the Sadian Woman is an analysis of Marquis de Sade's um, Hundred Days of Sodom and about the lives of Justine and Juliet. And the basic uh, premise of it is that morality demands a budget. And if you're going to have a morality, you better have it. She was a Marxist feminist and a, a, a fiction writer. And also, this was perhaps the first, I don't know, she's written others, but I think this is a polemic that she really got a lot of response to. I, I wrote to her because it helped me get clarity about my situation and what, what I was doing, you know. Certainly Andrew, uh, 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 certainly, uh, Andrew Dworkin didn't, you know. You know, Shelley Mars, um, there was a documentary made about Shelley Mars in which she was very honest and forthright about the kind of work she did to survive. Mm. And she refused to let it be seen. And then what, sir? Refused to let it be seen. Oh. It was made by friends of hers and they hadn't got. <coughs> <coughs> a release, and I did see it. Oh. And I thought it was a remarkable huh. uh, piece. Um, huh. it, it had such integrity and honesty to it, and I thought it was very important <coughs> that young people, where we, we sort of normalize sex work, and yeah. it, 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 they see um, what the, how one navigates contradiction, particularly when you get used to the money. Mm. Nothing else pays that kind of thing. No, money. That's true. Um, no. And I hope we someday that, I mean, I think that Shelley's a controversial performance artist, but I, I, I hope that someday she'll allow this film to be seen because I think it's one of the most important documentaries on a contemporary look at artists, cultural mm. worker, um, quote unquote right. sex worker. Right. Um, I'm not saying she's a prostitute or anything, just a sex worker, she's a massage therapist. That's probably a very good one. Um, the, so here we are, it's 1983, you've got leather dykes at the door not letting you out, uh, you've, got, you've got angry, angry, angry dykes uh, throwing bottles at you. It's almost a stereotype of, um, of some of the people that we know and that we like, you know? <laughs> but these women from Suriname grabbed my arm, one of them grabbed my arm and said, don't go, don't go. I have to tell you, we loved your performance. It's the first time we've ever seen white women performing like that. And that was as, as we were escaping out the back entrance, that we got validity from this nine, nine women from Suriname 
and I was like, I'll take that. <laughs> yeah. Um, <coughs> so your work, your work, you've, you've been doing these transgressive pieces, uh, trying to bring the material world into the art rarefied world of dance. Mm -hmm. yes. And when did you begin to look at um, gender expression and the boundaries that are implicit in, in, in the cultural definition of gender? I think it happened when I was four years old with my brother who used was a little queen. To, yeah, <laughs> dress and drag and used to play with my dolls. I didn't, I didn't want to play with dolls. And, um, you know, he'd love to put all the dolls in my pram and then race them around the block and have them all animate and jump up and down and then he'd come back and say, oh, Polly fell out and, that, and it was like, ah! <laughs> and, uh, oh, they were fighting, you know, and, and he, he, he would sort of animate them so that they would, you know, by, by pushing them really hard and that was his way of playing with my dolls. But there's a point where your cultural work mm. took on a different focus. That's definitely true, and that happened um, with the commission I got from, say, Mark's dance space in 1981, and I worked on this performance with Bradley Wester, who's a visual yeah, artist. Yeah, a beautiful visual artist. And so Bradley and I, I, I invited him. He, he, he lived... Beautiful um, gown he used to wear. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. He was a wonderful guy. And he lived... Uh, I lived on East 10th Street and he was two doors down, I think. So we developed this performance and it was called Arousing Reconstructions, which was performed at St. Mark's Church Dance Space in January 1982. And in that performance we tried to create a genderless choreography, a sort of androgynous choreography. A choreography. Oh my goodness, wait, say that word again. Androgynous to us? Yes. I just want to put that word out there. An androgynous, <laughs> yeah, and, and yeah. Well, that was our intention: was to have a, a choreography that was androgynous, that was neither male nor female, could be done by any gender. Yes, any gender. So, and we succeeded with that. But within the rehearsal process, Bradley said, "Well, I want to dress as a woman," and we were so competitive. And I said, "Oh well, I'm going to dress as a man." You know. So, we, we within the performance, we did the androgynous movement vocabulary that we developed and we also, it was a dance piece, but we also, he became a man, a, a woman and I became a man, and, but it was, it was more cross-dressing. You know? yeah, it was external expression yeah. of what gender is supposed to mean. Yeah, it was, um, yeah, and that was in uh, January, we prevent, presented it in January 1982. Um, at that time there wasn't any anything to read really around gender. I mean, I, I read Michel Foucault, uh, his Hercule Barbin, and also um, History of Sexuality, which was out. And the people uh, who really were interesting to us was um, Deleuze and Guattari, A Thousand Plateau. Um, the, that really gave us some clues. But there was this one semio text book, and it, oh, what was it called? It was, on, it was on sex, and I don't, I don't know if you remember this, but there was an image of a man who had killed himself through hanging, you know, while trying to achieve an erection at the back. He was in a closet. Anyway, there was uh, that, the material in there was very helpful, and you know, we we were grappling, we were trying to understand what it is that we were doing, and you know, we we were searching for new definitions, new ideas of. You and know, you trusted each other. Oh, totally, yeah. He was sort of like Donald. He was kind of like my Donald, you know. He, very he pretty looked, too. looked like him. He was also yeah. very pretty. I know. Yeah. As was your brother. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and also, we fought like brother and sister, you know. And um, and it was a, a very enjoyable experience to work with him. But it kind of. Had your brother died at this point? No, he died in '92. Yeah. Um, and so that kind of, you know, got me on this journey of uh, developing a kind of idea of what it is to be a man. And I, all through the 80s, I was performing different male characters in different places, like the Pyramid Club and the Mud Club. I performed and also danced Terio. And I was Limbo Lounge, um, mm -hmm. was another place. So, and then when ni in 19- These were all uh, nightclubs that had a very specific cultural bent. And not only had live music, 
and have DJ dancing, but also have performers uh, that were not musicians, so to speak. We're going to go back to this band in a, in a, in a bit. Oh, that's good. But let's just stay on this track right yeah. now. Uh, so you were performing in drag. Would you call it drag? Would you, um, yeah, it was drag. Like John Sex Drag? Because he was hyper sexual male. Who, John Sex? Yeah. No. No, it wasn't John Sex. It wasn't. It was more about taking on these different characters and performing them. And, and also, you know, like for instance, I had this. Cockney mod character called Jack Sprat. Like this. Hello, everybody. How you doing? All right? You know. Oh, my name's Jack Sprat. I'm a singer songwriter. I got this uh, song I wrote 25 years ago. It's called Money. And then uh, I had this music. It was on an accordion. And I sang with the music. And I had this Cockney character who was very funny because he. You know, I was a mod in the 60s, and um, the mod scene has only ever been documented by men, and it's about men. And they, they don't ask women's opinion, you know. W women are not... I've never heard a woman say she was a mod before, quite frankly. You know, no, but I was. Yeah. And um, So, actually, I wrote this monologue with a friend who, in, in England who was also a mod. And we remembered all these things about the guys, like they would be high on um, amphetamines all the time and they could never get an erection, you know, because if you're on speed, you know, and, you know, stuff like that, you know. And they thought they were bad. Uh, and they all did because they were, they were like peacocks, you know. Um, and so you as a girl, you had to be like the echo to their narcissism, you know, like they'd go, oh, do I look sharp? And you go, yeah, sharp, 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 sharp. <laughs> So that, that was your role. Because the mods were about style. It was about style, totally, yeah. But it was all... Like working class for the most part. Yes, so. it was. And, and the men were like peacocks, really, in strutting about, you know, and having all these women to sort of just... Uh, except, you know, I, I always had this objective perspective, having a brother like Donald and being able to grow up with him and learn how to do things like him, you know, think, think the way that he thought, you know. Uh, although, of course, I couldn't think the way he got, but he trained me. But uh, anyways, uh, you were asking about Raz and Reconstructors. Oh, yes, yeah, so then in 1989, a friend of mine from Amsterdam who's a sculptor was visiting Annie Sprinkle, and I didn't know Annie Sprinkle at that time, and uh, her name was Sonia Oudendijk, and she knew Annie, and she knew me. And Annie said she was looking for a woman who could do female to male and make it look authentic but she'd interviewed this transsexual Johnny Science mm -hmm. and she wanted some illustration to go with it. Quite good band. Absolutely. So anyway, so she recommended me and then Annie did this photo shoot with me. And that was in April eighty nine. Did she take the picture? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of them one of them is in the film. You know, the one with the where they focus on my pubic hair yeah. for about ten minutes. <laughs> yeah. That, that's an Annie Sprinkle photo. That's from that photo shoot, actually. Um, so we did that, this photo shoot, and I met Johnny for the first time. And really, it was the first time I'd had authentic facial hair. You know, I didn't know how to do that myself. And I'd always sort of just messed about with crayons and whatever. And I went out that night to the Whitney Museum, because it was an opening, it was the biennial, and I was supposed to meet some friends there, and I went with Sonia, and we immediately lost each other, and I was on my own, I was walking through the crowd, and I saw some friends, and I waved at them, and they just ignored me, and I, and I realized everybody thinks I'm mad, because they were treating me differently, you know, people, it was crowded, but people were making space for me, it never happens this morning, and I thought, wow, this is interesting, I'll just get myself a beer, so I was uh, standing with this beer and just observing the crowd, which is what men do, and checking everybody out. And this woman came up to me and started chatting me up. And I thought, oh my God, she must know that I'm a woman, you know? And I kept looking at her and thinking, she's, the light is going to dawn, and it didn't. And the way she was chatting me up, it was embarrassing because I recognized her chat up to me. You know? And then um, at some point, I couldn't stand it any longer, and I tried to sort of get away by like, turning my back to her, and she just would come around and talk to me some more. And she was very keen, you know? And that whole uh, phrase, treat them mean, keep them keen, it was very real to me at that moment. And uh, in the end, I just, against what I would do as a woman, I walked away from the situation. I went to, you know, I would never be that rude. You're so a male. 
And I went to the second floor of the museum. I was looking at some paintings. Oh, yeah. I felt this tap on my shoulder, and she had followed me and was acting like we were together. And I was thinking, oh, my God, this is so embarrassing. And and she could only see herself. And then I had this idea, well, this would be so cool if women had this opportunity to go out in the world as men, you know, find out and how the world treats you different. Well. Yeah. Right. And actually, Johnny who was teaching something called Drag King Workshop. Was, that was his idea. Johnny Science came up with that phrase, Drag King. And so he was teaching Drag King Workshop. Johnny was the person that Annie was interviewing. And he just started doing that. And I said, oh, well, I'm going to do that workshop. But it just involved makeup and dress up. And I said, well, if you're teaching a workshop, you've got to do some training. He said he didn't know how to do that. So I said, okay, well, why don't we work together? And so I would do the, he would do the makeup and styling and whatever, and I would, I would do the how to walk and how to sit and you know, take up space. And, you know, our acting exercises, you know, scene studies, that kind of thing. You know, my background is in theater, theater studies. And so he, he, he and I did a lot of these workshops, and we didn't even know that how popular they would become at the very beginning. We had no clue. And, you know, that was 89, 90. You know, by 93, there was a huge article in the Washington Post in the leisure section. And um, so it's actually on my website if you go to articles. It was a woman. It was a woman. Paula, she took the workshop. <laughs> and, okay, we can, we can find it. Yeah, uh, I mean, there's tons of material, and, you know, and then I got lots of, in, and I, lots of invitations to uh, do this workshop, and uh, especially on talk shows, you know, and, that, and when that article in the Washington Post came out, my phone didn't stop ringing, and it was just like every talk show in America was calling me, and, you know, we kind of, and I didn't know what to say, and none of them wanted to pay me, I was like, oh, why would I do this? Yeah. And then through a friend of Annie Sprinkle, Dolores French, who's a prostitute on television, and I think she was a prostitute, but then she got on all these talk shows as a prostitute, and that became her income. You know. um, she said to me, well, you have to join the union, the American Federation of TV and Radio Artists. And at the time, it was 700. Yeah, after she said, you have to join after her. It was 700 bucks at that time, which was a lot of money. It's like 2,000 hours. So anyway, I joined after her. And then every phone call I got, I, I asked if they had enough after contract. And they all, well, they either said yes, and they said no. You know, I remember one saying, what is about you artists that you always want to be paid isn't it enough we're giving you exposure and I said you know something time is money and you're wasting mine right now my time <laughs> goodbye <laughs> it's like you know I, 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 I said to this person you know I'm one person you want me to uphold a multi-million dollar corporation with my ideas no way you know you, you have to pay me you know did anyone tell you yeah, they did? No, after the... Oh, no, I always got paid. Because of the after contract? Yes, yeah. but before that, I did Phil Donahue in 91, and they gave me a wages in lieu of unearned income. Okay. It's called? Because Phil Donahue no, had done. aesthetics. He had, he had ethics, <laughs> He had ethics. Well, so I was, we're, we're, we're traveling over sort of quickly a very important time. Mm. 80, 88, 89, 90, 91, 92, okay? Um, other people, because of the drag king, uh, in many ways people saw, will remember, will remember your work as drag king work. Yes. When in fact, am I correct that your, your work was not so much drag team work, but empowerment work of women to understand the boundaries of gender that are unexpressed, that are internalized. Yeah, it's, it's a behavior that's learned. When, when, when Johnny and I first started teaching drag king workshops, this is what drag king meant to us. But as drag king became part of popular culture, and entertainment. it came to be known, basically, as women dressing, you know, putting on facial hair, packing, putting on men's clothes, and performing for other women, you know. So it got taken up by the lesbian scene, which is fine. But, but, 
Morris controversy happened. Where Shelly Morris actually became so much like the sexist male that numbers of women who would go to her performance uh, yeah. would object to the kind of man that she had transformed herself into. Do you remember any of that? Of course, I, I used to perform together at the Pyramid Club. I remember that. So, how do you um, talk about this yin yang representation of the male? By a, a biological female. Well, I, I think that I thought it was very funny, and I thought she was parodying these like buffoon guys. It was almost like you know, it was comedy. She's a comic, you know. So if you, can't, you thought it was unfair the kind of criticism that she was getting. I thought those people were just um, didn't have any sense of humor, you know. Sort of like the the Dutch women at the performance of the same kind of. A, you mean the, the, when we went there to perform? Yeah, it's like, it's a political correctness going crazy, you know. Shelley's obviously a very sensitive individual and she knows what she's doing. You know, you just have to watch Virgin Machine to see that, you know. Well, it's interesting when you're a transgressive artist. Uh, you're still sort of um, who gets acceptable and, who, and when you cross the line, when, when transgression is about crossing the line to, to some degree. But you know as well as I do that culture in this country is policed by the academy. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. It's it's very it's very disturbing, you know. That that, but as artists, how do we survive? You know, we make a pact with the devil in a way by working with the academy. But without the academy, you know, would our work get recorded? You know, that book of mine, University of Michigan Press. You know, but at the same time that our work gets recorded, it also gets interpreted. You know, sort of like colonized. If you like. So academics do, they colonize work of artists. It's always interested me that academics are very well paid. Um, and they they live in a, an ivory tower in some ways, a very privileged position to make a lot of judgments and, and, and challenge young people or students or uh, to do things that they themselves don't do themselves and, and then comment on it. And I, I, I'd much rather see some, you know, I won't say any names, but I'd much rather see them put their butt in the center of a different place and perform what they're talking about than pass judgment and, and set criteria that these young people, using the word generic, young people, attempt to do, to, to live up to, but are not realistic. They don't, they don't take in the real world. Well... There's a disconnect, you know, between conceptualizing and actually doing something. You know, it's a big disconnect. And you know, I've I've learned through the body. And I, you know, I have a whole training in dance and also in martial arts. I studied Aikido from 1977. I still do Aikido. I have a third degree black belt from New York Aikido High, and that was what saved my ass in New York doing Aikido. Um, was I mean, like, when you say save my ass in, in physical and threatening situations, oh, that or just sense of self? Both. But, you know, Aikido was sort of like, it was like my parent. You know, Aikido kind of disciplined me, you know. Um, and I, you know, I have a parent who's just me, you know. So Aikido was, going to Aikido, you know, once or even twice a day when I was really into it, you know few times going to Aikido a lot and, and becoming really good at it and, and then enjoying uh, all the possibilities of the body, what you can do with the body. I mean, it's, it's so exciting. Um, <coughs> so you're on the trajectory of doing these workshops with Johnny. Oh, right, yeah. Uh, and, and, um, not, would I be correct in saying that they were less about entertainment and more about empowerment? Well, I, I think it's more about exploring the possibility to be more, to be more, more than who, who you are, than this allotted role that you're given as a woman, which is so limited. You know, this is a woman, you know, that all this behavior is expected of you, you know, that you're going to 
look desirable, that you're going to have a, a be pleasant, be nice to people all the time, be ready to smile, um, acceptability, you know. And what's called normal behavior is, is such a construction. So maybe you're having a horrible day and you, you're still expected to smile, make everybody else feel good. That's sort of woman's role. It's like it's all about everybody else and how the people respond to you. It's not about you, how you're doing, you know. So that was something that I, I saw that men were able to do. They could be in their own world and don't care what other people are saying, just do what they want to do. And even to the point that they are so vulgar and then they do stuff like, you know, I never see women doing that. You know, I'm yes, extreme, you. but I'm just saying that it was about them having the option to be more, if you like, mm -hmm. expanding, expanding. Let me ask you a dangerous question. In our postmodern age, do you think that there is a fundamental difference between men and women? Um, you know, it's the old nature nurture debate, and that will never ever be solved because testosterone does do things to people, just as estrogen does too. And but you know, you have so many people that don't fit the stereotype. You know, you have mannish women, you have effeminate men, you have. It's not gender expression. Pardon? Isn't that the range of gender expression uh, that gets police? That gets police? I, think, I think a lot of people conform to being a man or a woman just because it's easier to live like that, you know. I'm talking more about the body, yeah. the body itself. <coughs> uh, female bodies and male bodies are different, physically different. Uh, no matter what the external presentation may be, the internal looks are not changeable. Mm. And what does that mean uh, uh, in terms of, not in terms of power, but in terms of personhood? Are you talking about identity? Well, identity seems to be about external. I'm talking about the actual physical body, uh, the science of the physical body, um, Men never have ages. Uh, women, I mean, they're just basic fundamental yeah, differences. Yeah, I know. I know. And, uh, and we can talk about cultural history and how that has uh, constructed the gender roles that goes to the body that is just a reproduction. It's usually reproduction and property yeah. are usually the, the basic sort of uh, conditioning principle. But I'm, I'm, we, we live in a particular moment where people are doing everything in the world to deny their body and create the subjective fantasy of who they are. Yeah. Uh, and the academic community has very much put that forward, that subjectivity is much more important than concrete reality of, of, of one's own body. And does that create a tension? Is it important to sort of what I'm asking you to do uh, as someone who has really um, jumped the borders of expression? Uh, but do you, we talked a little while ago about androgyny, which is a physical representation. Um, and I worry, this just made me my friend, Diana, and we don't have to agree on it. But I, it's hard to raise a question anywhere because people's feelings get hurt. Because you know, what? People's feelings get hurt. You can't say you are born a female. You know, or you were born a male. It doesn't, regardless of how you self-identify, subjectively identify, uh, call yourself, dress as you are, the denial of, 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 of body seems to be very much a part of the current dialectic that we're in. Do you have any reaction to what I just said? Well, I, you see, there's so much in our biological heritage that is never considered. The fact that, you know, we, we evolved over five billion years to become the bipeds that we are, and all of the different organisms, the reptilian, the amphibian, the quadruped, all of the, all of that biological heritage that's gone into who we are, and yet we, we confine this idea of who, of who we are to some, you know, who your family is or who your friends are, you know, what your history is or who you're connected to. But what about that? It's a very basic instinctive thing, you know. What about the instinctual aspect of personhood, you know? Um, the gut reaction. 
how, how people respond to that. I mean, this is an issue because what happens through the process of conceptualization is that you deny your animal instincts, you know. And when I say animal, we are animals, we're human we're animals. And that, I think, has a lot... Your natural instinct. Your, your, in, your instinct. And, and people are so removed from it that they don't even know what those instincts are. I mean, say you're in a restaurant and you're with a group of people and there's somebody at the next table. The candle overturns and the serviette catches fire. The person looks at the fire. My animal instinct would be to get the water jug and but they look at the fire. This happens. I saw this. I witnessed this. And I thought, where is their fear? Where is their response? Where is their animal instinct? Danger. Water. Nothing. And, and this, I find this very dangerous, you know. If, if we if we're not in touch with those very basic things that animals have, you know. What is the time to leave, you know? What is the time to, like, really go for it? Or, you know, I mean, these, these are animal instincts. It's like knowing gut, gut level what you, what you ought to do at any point in time. Let me ask it a different way. Um, do you think that gender identity trumps physical reality? <laughs> You know, the thing about gender identity is that somebody who defines themselves as something, you know, a trans woman, they define themselves as a woman, but as a physical reality, you can look at them and say, that person's male, because they have an Adam's apple, they have a deep, deep voice. But the reality is that we aren't in any position to, I think, to, to, to you know, make some qualification about somebody else's identity, how they identify themselves. I, I, I really don't feel that. I mean, somebody looks like a woman and identifies as, as a man, then that's what they decided. I don't know. <laughs> it's a very, I mean, we're in this moment where these are the large questions which are very hard to talk about. Right, definitely. Um, and uh, I've always believed, and I think it's a feminist principle, that sure. we each have the right to control our body, and no one else should be policing or controlling of my body. But as a feminist, uh, being female had, has historically had, from a feminist point of view, a real definition. And it's now being challenged by men to say, I am woman, or by women who reject being a woman and say, I am man. And that kind of tension, which, is, which I feel a lot around us today, it's, it's sort of your work brought to a certain point. And then, to me, a very important book is, is uh, Jack Halberstam, Judith Halberstam, book, Female Masculinity. Well, which he totally dishes me. He totally dishes. He never did a workshop with me, and that's one thing. Well, that's Jack. Then. Yeah, it does. doesn't matter. His scholarship is questionable, and, and that's what Steve Bottoms takes.